Hey, everybody. Welcome to One More Round from your friends at the World of CONCACAF. I'm Eric Schmitz. And I'm Donald Wine. And we are Sans Jonathan tonight. Unfortunately, couldn't join us. But we want to do a special episode for you, our patrons. Thank you for the support, uh, supporting our Patreon. Again, patreon.com slash podcast. If you're listening to this, you know where it is because that's where you're listening to it. But we really appreciate your support. Uh, we couldn't do this without that, and uh, yeah, we're this is this is just us hanging out at the bar after the regular podcast. So we don't really have a regular podcast for this one, but yeah, just hanging out at the bar. That's what it is. Yeah, Donald, what are you drinking tonight? Are you drinking anything? No, I was. So we're recording this on Sunday, October sixteenth. El Clasico was this morning, mm-hmm. so I obviously had some drinks for that game, which was great for me. Um, and that is the last part of the, uh, at least until we start talking about some things, that is the most of the UEFA talk that we'll have on this particular one more round. But yeah, I, I had drinks at the bar and I haven't, I'm just drinking water right now. Nice. I am drinking a Pills Mafia Pilsner from Thin Man Brewery in uh, Buffalo, New York. Um, Pills Mafia, obviously, as you said, your team had a good day. Uh my Buffalo Bills had a good day as well. You sure did. Um, so I am enjoying it with a fine Pilsner. My Lions had a great day. They didn't lose. It's always good. They're yeah. on a bye, so they couldn't win either. Yeah. But I think not losing is winning when it yeah. comes to the Lions. But, Donald, you just got back from Europe, right? I did, yes. Uh, a nice week in Europe, which was a lot of fun. Yeah, and you were there for the U.S. women's national team. They had a couple friendlies. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so I originally, that was the, the I guess, the uh, foundation for the trip uh, was the two matches, particularly the one in London. Um, I have never been to London. I've been to Heathrow Airport, Gatwick Airport several times and always flown through but never left the airport. So, yeah, that it was- doesn't count. It doesn't count unless you leave the airport. That is correct. We it, as we did twice in Barbados, <laughs> um, to get bacon with a side of shrimp. Um, oh yeah. So, I I think yeah. So it was that was the foundation of that was going to London. I was going to go to the men's games uh, in Dusseldorf and Murcia, mm-hmm. but I was like, hey, this is this is the prime opportunity to go to London to see it for the first time to go to Wembley see mm-hmm. our women play a big match and then they announced the match in spain which was in pamplona and so i was like well i gotta knock that off so yeah twist my arm that, go I'm, to yeah go to pamplona go back to spain i started my trip off in spain uh which i know we'll get into details but i started my trip off off in spain and basically just booked a round trip to and from madrid because i was like you know what i feel like there's a hunch that the second game will be in spain just kind of doing the educated guesses of who they could play um Spain had already qualified for the World Cup so they didn't have games that were meaningful in October so I was like hey this is probably the second one it's just a matter of where end up being Pamplona so I said yep let's do it nice so we'll start with that first game in London first of all you were in London did you have Nando's of course I did I had, so first of all I had Nando's twice <laughs> um I had Nando's as a second dinner uh my last night there um, and then I had it at the airport at Gatwick because at the airport, their Nando serves breakfast. And oh. I'm here to tell you that the English breakfast, just okay. Nando's breakfast has a lot of potential if done here in the United States because we will cook our eggs right. And the chicken sausage will be, I mean, the chicken sausage was great. The egg was cooked that runny English way. And they don't do that right. They do it right here in the United States. If we just had that. And also, you could have a side of of a um, uh, hash brown with chili jam, really, really good. A side of halloumi cheese that you could kind of put on there, banging. Like everything about it was banging except for the English egg. That was it. Like the English egg brought it down to maybe a seven as opposed to a nine. So okay. I, I think there's a lot of potential. Nando's USA, if you're hearing this, um, you know, at Podcast, DM us, send us Nando's. Actually, send it to me, and I will. I will see if it makes it to Eric and, and Jonathan. Um, I can't make any promises. This is bullshit because you're the one with a local Nando's. Jonathan and I are in a wasteland 
away from Nando's locations. Sounds like you need to visit. It does sound like I need to visit. But uh, enough about Nando's. We could talk about it all day. Mm-hmm. But I want to hear about Wembley. Like, obviously, this was your first time in London. So this is your first time going to a game in London. First time going to Wembley Stadium, like one of the world's renowned stadiums for a sold out USA England game. What was the vibe like there? So let me let me backtrack uh, because I think it's it's cool to tell you about the whole day because it was a long full day. Uh, it started out for me coaching the American Outlaws women's team that we had formed, and I and I say team in air quotes because we didn't really have a team until that Friday morning. Uh, we basically every time we do away trips, we try to schedule if where we can some fan friendlies with the fans of that local country. And so the England uh, group, England fans, uh, FC, they had reached out to us saying, hey, we want to organize a a women's game the day of the match. And so they have to keep the structure kind of uh, formed, right? Like this is what they do. They are all supporters of different clubs in England. And each of these clubs, whether they be Manchester United or Bury Town, they all have fan groups that play soccer matches against other fan groups. And then they, from there get called up to the national team of fan uh, of fans. We was very had, organized, very organized. It, it was very organized for them. They had like, we had a team sheet and they had where their, where the clubs were. Oh my God. Basically looked like a full lineup. Us. Um, I did this via Google form. Um, I said, Hey, who's going to London? Who's interested in playing this game on Friday morning? And got a hodgepodge of people who had never met each other. So when I show up to the field and I've been telling them, hey, we don't really do this like this. And they go, how many games has your team played? I go, what do you mean? They go, oh, well, you know, like how many, like, what's your record? Like, this is our first women's game. No, no, no. Like, how many games have you played together as unit? I was like, my unit is meeting each other in the locker room right now as we speak for the first time. And they're like, oh, my God are you kidding me? Like, and so they had this look like we're going to kill these kids. We won two to one. Uh, nice. Me as a coach undefeated. I have retired really? as a coach, so I will remain undefeated. Got it. We have a nice trophy that went back to uh, Lincoln. Um, nice. So that was the first part of the day. Um, a lot of fun. And uh shout out to England fans. FC Lioness is there. They were really cool. We didn't go to the night before or to the pregame party. And uh, it's at this bar called Windermere which is about a 45 minute walk from Wembley. Uh-huh. So we pregame there. It's a nice, like basically neighborhood pub. And by neighborhood pub, I mean like if you lived in a tiny neighborhood, wherever you lived and you went to like the local bar that has just the people in your neighborhood there, that is basically this bar that we invaded. So it was a lot of, it was pretty cool. Everyone there was awesome. Uh, and then we go to the game and Wembley is a massive stadium. It's 90,000 seats. Every seat had been given away or, or sold, at least. I will say that the actual attendance was less than the sellout capacity because there were uh, rail strikes throughout mm-hmm. England. And so a lot of people basically who were coming in from other parts of England didn't take the risk of coming in and getting stuck because of these uh, because of these rail strikes. So uh, that was unfortunate for them. Obviously, you know, a, th- a lot of people were supporting the workers in the strike. It just made it where it was a little inconvenient for people to make it. So um, with that said, it did not feel like there was only 78,000 people there. It felt like it was a full 90,000 seat uh, capacity crowd. Uh, They were in it the whole game. Wembley is a very like just interesting stadium. The wide concourses, um, which you don't really see in Europe. Mm-hmm. Uh, or even, I mean, honestly, you know, for us, we've been all around Cocky Cap. You don't really see wide concourses. Oh, and yeah. that's basically because there's plenty of room for people to drink on the concourses before they go into the stands because they can't bring their beers with them. So uh, there was plenty of places you never felt cramps, even though there was a bunch of people there. Um, there's a nice little district as you walk up to Wembley where there's a bunch of bars and stuff. But each bar was packed full of people. Yeah. So it was just a just a whole vibe in Honestly, I think the one thing that I haven't seen outside of the United States before, all of the like lamp posts 
had little like those little signs that we hold up. Yeah. And they say like U.S. versus England or whatever. Each of them, each player on the roster had their own sign and the coach That's awesome. leading all the way up to the steps to Wembley, which I thought was really cool. That's really awesome. And I mean, this this was one of the biggest crowds that England's ever had for their women's team. Yeah. Could you could you sense that this was like a moment for their program? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, they built it as like the world champions versus the European champions. They, this was a big deal for them. It was a big deal. Uh, and I, I don't know why Vlaco thought it was just another friendly, but this was not another friendly. This was a big, uh, they kind of considered it their litmus test. Like how far have they come in the women's game by testing themselves against the best team in the world? And it was a back and forth game. Um, I thought VAR did us in. Like, I don't think, I, I, I think England played well enough to win. I also think we played well enough to win too, but VAR took that away from us, took a few yeah. opportunities, gave them one, took a couple away from us. Well, obviously England being the host gets to decide this. It feels very CONCACAFI that all of a sudden there's VAR in a friendly when, you know, right. friendly, friendlies, no, no one cares. You call it, you call it, whatever. There's VAR in a friendly, of course, you know. Helping the home team. You got to get that. Yeah, oh, there was some home cooking there. Um, but yeah, everyone was cool. The fans were cool. It, it wasn't, it didn't have the feel of like a men's game where uh, it was, there was hostilities. Um, everyone was just having a great time. It wasn't even people really talking trash on the way out. It was just like, hey, we came to see a great game featuring two of the best women's teams on the planet and had a great time doing it. Everyone had a great time. Um, and despite the loss, like, I mean, was row one like you can't get better than that like i i almost can't go back because how am i going to do better than this match but it was it was a great experience it's exactly the type of experience that i envisioned when i planned this trip that's awesome so you have that experience in london and you go to spain tell me about what was the game what was experience in spain like you'd been to spain before would you do yes. it different this time? Or did you just go back and run back all the cool things you had done previously? Well, Pamplona, I had never visited before. That's the, if you think about Spain as a, a matador with his hat on, like the, the shape of Appropri- Spain. Appropriate uh, analogy, you know? Yeah. So if you think about it as a matador with his hat on, the only real part I haven't visited is the hat itself. Okay. And Pamplona is in the hat. That's basically Basque country. And Galicia, which is the little corner uh, right above Portugal. So uh, I, I was like, all right, I'm going to do Pamplona. Um, I thought about taking the train. I thought about flying. I ended up driving um, because I wanted to go to Andorra after the game. Um, my only issue with that is I thought I was doing the Lord's work by renting a, an electric car. Um, and the electric car um, was rated to be one that had a range of 236 miles. Meanwhile, it's like 200 miles from Madrid to Pamplona. So I'm thinking, this is easy. Go there, charge up, drive the Andorra, charge up, come back. We're good. Well, this thing got about 75 kilometers, which is about 50 miles uh, before it was basically drained and you have to stop. And they don't have, um, they don't have fast chargers like they do here in the United States where Mm -hmm. you can charge up to like 80% in 20 minutes. Um, Charging up to 50% took two hours for one. When I was in Pamplona, it took eight hours to charge up to full. And uh, yeah, so I, I didn't get a chance to go to Andorra. I ended up just going to Pamplona and going back to Madrid. I'll get to that part in a second, but Pamplona itself is really, really cool. It's a very small town. The like, uh, in in the sense that the um the old part of the city, the one that everyone's familiar with, with the running of the bulls, if you've seen those, um, or at least watched them on TV, that is the main hub of the city. So everything kind of revolves around that and spokes out from there. There's the Plaza de Toros, which is the bull fighting ring, which is a couple of blocks away from there, and it's a massive joint. I think it's the third biggest in the world. Um. Madrid is the biggest, I want to say, followed by, I want to say, Mexico City. And wow. um, uh, so those were there, but it's it's cool. It was just really cool to walk around and kind of see those sites. We pre-gamed on Plaza de Castillo, which is the main square um, in Old City. 
easy, easy talk going through all the, you know, kind of the back streets and alleys. Um, it's just a lot of flair there, a lot of flavor, a lot of great food, um, a lot of great wine. And uh, yeah, it was a great time. And I think going to the stadium, El Sadr, um is one of the newer stadiums. It's been renovated or at least built in the last few years for Osasuna. And the inside, the inner bowl is amazing. It's There's safe standing everywhere. The entire upper deck is safe standing. That wasn't being used, obviously, for this game. But they drew a crowd of 11,000, which is a record for for women's soccer in Spain. So yeah. uh, at least for on the national team. So that's really cool to have kind of been a part of two historic crowds um, yeah. for this for this window. Now, obviously, there's a lot of stuff going on with with Spain and their women's national team. Did you get a sense that like that kind of cast a shadow over all of this or did? Oh, was yeah. It the team that was there. It was kind of focused on the players that showed up. Well, every time they put the coach on the Jumbotron, he was booed loudly, whistled nice. loudly. Um, every single time they announced his name, he would get boos and whistles. Like, so they were really, you know, it, the crowd that was there. And mind you, the tickets were like five euros a piece, and it was buy one, get one free. I'm sorry, it was 10 <laughs> euros, buy one, get one free. So oh, nice. you got two tickets for 10 euros. And so that's how they were able to get a bunch of people in there. But everyone there was very knowledgeable about what was going on. So it wasn't like we were schooling them on like why they should be booing their coach. They were doing that, you know, well before we entered the fray. So um, I I don't want to say that was cool, but it was like, hey, it's great that they were very knowledgeable about what was happening, what was going on. The other thing about the match is the players obviously – played like they wanted to remain on the team. They didn't, you know, necessarily care that the, you know, 15 or 16 players remove themselves because mm-hmm. they knew that that was their opportunity to play. And, and they, so they played with some inspiration in that regard. Here's the other thing that kind of like wraps it in a bow. Despite all the circulation around the coach, the coach gets a draw against Sweden, a win against the United States. They go from eighth in the world to sixth in the world just in time they are one of the they are the last seeded team for the draw for the women's world cup this, wow. this coming the coming weekend yeah. and it's all because of that win that win gave them just enough points to put them into sixth place if they don't get that win against the united states they're in seventh and they're in pot two and potentially going up against the united states and some of these other teams now they get to avoid the best teams in the world that is a mind-boggling thing considering that these this team almost didn't play this window because of what was happening. Yeah, that, that is wild. And you know the stakes were high for Spain. Like from the US perspective, do you really do you really feel that they put in effort in taking these games seriously as England and Spain did? Or did the results kind of reflect the fact that it's like one side was taking this seriously and the other side was look treating these like any other friendlies. I think from the coaching perspective, the coaching staff did not take this seriously. They treated these as normal friendlies. And I think that's a shame because these weren't normal friendlies and that's partially why they scheduled them. They, they didn't just schedule England at Wembley because it was something to do. They did it because it was supposed to be a big deal. They scheduled Spain because it was supposed to be a big deal. I think from the player's perspective, I think they took it seriously. But as you know, there's been a lot going on with them over the last yeah. week and a half. Talk and about it's understandable, you know? Yeah, it's understandable that they didn't give their best effort on the field. Um, and against Spain, it was really evident that, you know, they just weren't sharp. Um, they weren't playing well as a unit. And I think that has a lot to do with it. Just their minds are all elsewhere. Uh, and just that that effort that we know that the women's national team, U S women's national team gives on a regular basis. That just wasn't there. And it was, it was, it was very clear why it wasn't there. So I'm not faulting the players at all um, for toughing it out. Uh, but I think from a coaching perspective, they coached as if these were two normal friendlies that they can just get evaluation from. And the stakes were a little bit higher uh, because obviously from the England's perspective, they were playing, to measure up against us. And for Spain, the coach was coaching his ass off because he wanted everyone to take their mind off of him. So that is, 
it, you have to match that intensity on the road. And it's same thing that we experienced on the men's side in World Cup qualifying. If you don't match that intensity as the road team, you will get yeah. eaten alive. And that's yeah. kind of what happened. And the results reflect that. And for me, it's super frustrating that the U.S. women's the U- U.S. soccer has done a terrible job of like getting the U.S. women games that are tests for them. Like they will play back to back friendlies in one one or two cities in the U.S. against how, like the Nigeria ones. Um, those aren't necessarily real tests when you're not really going into tough environments against tough teams. And it seems like they kind of let the opportunity to find, they were finally doing that and they kind of let the opportunity to really test themselves. They let that slip. So this is where I'll push back because I think uh, a lot of people have to realize that that it's not always U.S. soccer's fault when it comes to scheduling on the women's side. A lot of it is, uh, and I'll tell you for, she believes they've told us straight up that, Hey, we've tried to call some of the best teams in the world to come to she believes, but they also have started like England started their own similar tournament. Uh, France started their own similar tournament. Uh, I believe Canada went over to play in, in the England one. So they didn't want to go, but a lot of don't want to play the United States for a couple of reasons. One, the euros were coming up Mm -hmm. and they didn't want to have the jet lag. They also COVID was still in the building. So that was still a, a major factor. And, and, we suck at COVID, so players, yeah. you know, teams didn't want to come over. But the biggest factor is when you're going into a major tournament, you want confidence. And everyone felt that if they came over and got smashed by the United States on the road, that it would demoralize their team entering a major tournament, and they didn't want that either. So we, so U.S. soccer actually got a lot of rejections. It was after the Euros that a lot of teams were like, okay, we don't qualify for World Cup. Euros are done. Qualify for the Olympics. Now we have this open slate of of a window for for you guys play, but we want you to come over here. And I think we've talked about this. I think the women need to test themselves more on the road. But I think at a certain point, it's also up to the teams to say, yeah, we'll play you. Yeah. As as a former U.S. men's national team coach would, would frequently say, you have to go challenge yourself in Europe. You know, right. they, they need to do that more. But it also begs the questions like, is U.S. soccer better off even doing She Believes if they could be going somewhere else and playing tougher games that might actually help them competitively? Or is the revenue that they generate from actually running the thing worth, worth more to them? I don't know. We could do a whole but She pop- Believes used to be the, the tournament that got big teams over here. I mean, it used yeah. to be you played France, you played England, you played Germany maybe a japan maybe a brazil canada spain but like yeah again over the last couple of years be, mainly because of covid but also because of those other factors those teams just decided not to come over to the united states yeah well i mean they started she believes because they didn't think the algarve cup was enough competition it's Correct. like you could probably figure out one or two other countries that would be like yeah we agree let's do something better and not necessarily have to force everybody to fly over here and send our team over there. Also make, make another factor, tougher. another factor is for a while, that's all the team played. That's all they played was top 10 teams. Yeah. And so when you, how many times can you play Brazil before people get tired? How many times can you play France before people get tired? And they say, we want to see some new opponents. And so for the United States, they're like, yo, well, we're in this dilemma now because you want us to play new opponents, but the new opponents are worse so when we play them people go oh you should be playing the top teams this isn't helping and so they go well we tried that and then you told us not to so we're going over here and now you tell us go back over there i can get how it's confusing especially for the for the team for the players the players are just play whoever shows up they'll i mean none of them have any fear they'll play anybody but i think at the end of the day that's the dilemma they face to stay number one you have to play the best teams but the best teams may not always want to play you. And also you could get just kind of uh, what's the word you kind of get into a, like just a, a plateau yeah. by just playing the same teams over and over and over. Yeah. I, th- I think we know the, the solution to this is Island aways. They Nations need to go, ch- go challenge themselves 
at Arnos Vale Stadium. They need to go to the Truman Bodden Sports Complex. They need to go to the tough places to really, truly challenge themselves and bring the team together. Look, I, I'm just going to say this right now, and I know you agree with me. Um, the first team, the first team to schedule a friendly or get drawn into some Nations League or something at Arnold's Vale Stadium in St. Vincent, I got the first bottle of Captain Bly. That's on <laughs> me because I need a, I need a few bottles. I've been scouring the, the earth for one. Cannot find one. So I guess I just need to go back is what we're saying. Damn. Nations League is right around the corner. Right around the corner. Let's go. Clock, clock is ticking. But in that spirit, so just wrapping up your European uh, jaunt, uh, give me the best liquor, booze you had, and then give me the best meal you had that does not, the best non-Nando's meal. Okay, so the best meal was the shoom um in london absolutely phenomenal everyone everyone who has been to london has always said yo you gotta go to shoom when you go gotta go gotta go so i did and our buddy vish even told me which one to go to because he's like this one has like the art on the wall you want to see that i'm like okay great and yeah that lived up to the height it was absolutely phenomenal the dude when i ordered my meal um dude thought i wasn't gonna finish it uh-huh. And so I just gave him that look like, bro, that's not even this that much food. Like I'll terrorize this. And literally, like I had maybe a couple of scraps left, but like plate was plates were clean, man. Like that, like dude was just like, hmm, good job, <laughs> good work, a normal meal for us. So yes, that was easily the best meal. Um, let's see. In Spain, we had a lot of wine, a lot of sangria. All of it's very good. All of it's very dirt cheap. Um. If you go to Spain, like there's no real uh, like brand or anything you need to try. I will say this. I do have a brand, a, a bottle of Spanish brandy, 15 year that I got at the airport. Um, it's from Barcelona. Um, and if you have brandy, they they have like a region of Spain that makes a lot of good brandies. Uh-huh. This one's one of them. Uh, and I remember it from when I was doing study abroad back in 2003. So I got a bottle. So I'm looking forward to opening that over the next few days. Very nice. Love to hear it. Um, I guess the last thing I want to ask you, Lo, how does the experience vibes wise change when you're going to away games in Europe versus our beloved CONCACAF? Like obviously CONCACAF exists in a place where they excel at one primary thing, and that is vibes. So mm-hmm. what? how does Europe compare when it comes to games like this? I mean, the vibes are are a little different, right? Like, mm-hmm. their, their vibe is just established traditions, right? Mm-hmm. Like, I went to a Real Madrid match. I went to a Chelsea match. Uh, or, I'm sorry, not Chelsea, Crystal Palace. Um, yeah. I, I went to a Leganes match. Like, they have their traditions, and no matter what, they will always do those traditions. And so that is part of the allure of going to some of these matches and going to some of these stadiums is that you walk into the history of the club and just like all of that, that, and so their vibes are more about like, here's our history. Here's our, here's our tradition. Here's our, you know, mantra. And you go off of that. Whereas here in CONCACAF, your vibes are just like, yo, you could go in and, you know, again, we could go into a stadium and bring beers with us. We can <laughs> bring we can bring the vibe and bring the party in with us. We can get jerk chicken for you know like two dollars a piece and like just mash on that while you're going in. You can you know be on a beach with a umbrella drink in your hand, and then an hour later you're in a stadium. Like those are things that you can do. You cannot do those in in Europe. Like no matter, I don't care where you're going. If you're mm-hmm. playing Mallorca, you could not be on a beach and then also be in a stadium and have the same type of vibe that you have here. So I think theirs is more based on, hey, this is Europe. We have the history. We have the tradition. We have the, you know, the best teams, whatever, right? Like they hang their hat on that. Mm-hmm. CONCACAF is like, we don't care about all that stuff. Yeah. We just we just want you to have a great time. The soccer is going to be just as great, but you're going to have a better time because, damn it, you're on an island. And we have the best alcohol on the planet. 
you're just, and you could drink in the stadiums, uh, which mm-hmm. you can't in, in a lot of European places. Uh, so those vibes are just negated by the fact that they have, you know, Tanqueray zero. Uh, <laughs> it, whereas in, you know, we've been to games where they're pouring, they're pouring, you know, before pandemic, obviously, they're yeah. pouring rum out of a bottle into your mouth directly. And then you just kind of gave them a dollar yeah. or gave them two dollars and they would be on their merry way. and They would just go to the next person. Vibes are 1000 percent higher here than they are in Europe when it comes to that. Yeah. Europe sounds miserable. <laughs> I, Don't get I, me wrong. I had a great time. Had, a, yeah. had an absolutely wonderful time. I, I and honestly, it goes back to the the travel part, right? Like you and I, we we started this podcast because we've all been to some really cool places to watch soccer. Mm-hmm. Europe is no exception to that. So I encourage everyone, if there is a road trip, you're like, hey. For me, again, I had never been to London. All I needed was a real reason and like no excuses. And the women playing at Wembley against England, I'm like, that's no excuse. I yeah. got to be there. Like that's a, that's just a given. Um, and so make those make those plans. Like after the World Cup, there's going to be a ton of time for the men and the women to go on the road and play in various places. And even if it's in the United States, I know domestically, you know, we always talk about the road trips. The international trips are always great. But if you have a city in the United States, you've never been to in a matches there, make that the excuse, make that the reason and just go. You'll have a great time. I mean, really, we talk about the cultural experiences. Like that's why we want, why we do this podcast. Like we want to document not only our travels, but talk about like the cultural differences and the difference in vibes and all the good food we eat and all the great things we drink it's like you get that in domestically like you can go to good barbecue towns you could go to good nightclub towns like there's something in a, that makes every city what it is and the soccer's just kind of the scheduling for you like you're going there to this town this weekend because this is happening Right. And find, finding a way to fill out around the trip with the local foods, the hot, like the local hot spots, whatever the local drinks are, your local beers. Like that's, that's kind of the point, you know? It's not about the 90 minutes as much as the entire trip. Look, if you notice out there, when we do the laser focus, we spend a little time on the soccer, but we spend more time on like the history, the culture, the yeah. the vibes, the, yeah. the the food and drink. Like if we've been there, like how we, you know, got to the country. And like you said, Eric, like we could go to Grenada whenever we wanted. <sighs> right. Mm-hmm. But we're going to Grenada in the last weekend in March because there's a soccer game going on that weekend. Yeah. That's the reason why we're going on that particular weekend. So that's why I think these are important. Like, Hey, write down a bucket list of countries you want to visit. If there's a match there and it doesn't have to involve your home team, it could be like, yo, you know, Brazil's playing Argentina and, you know, South Korea, like, let's go. <laughs> like it, de- like if you have a reason to go on a particular weekend, go, it's going to be a lot of fun. The world cup in Australia, New Zealand, go, you know, like we're going to be in Qatar. Why? Like you've never been to Qatar. Yeah. The men are For playing good there, reason. So like, for good yeah. reason. Yeah. The men are playing there. You're like, I'm going to a World Cup. Like, yeah. It's a, it happens to be in Qatar. We're going to Qatar. Like, that is how you're supposed to approach this. And obviously, we're fortunate that we're able to, you know, take time off and, you know, mm-hmm. afford all these things. And so we're not telling you to go on every single trip. Like, if no. you can, that's awesome. Pick your spots. Pick, pick your spots. Pick your one. Pick your two. And use that passport, baby. Mm-hmm. Yeah. All you got to do is apply for it. They'll give you one, Mm -hmm. you know? And yeah, like we're about a month away from getting on planes and going to Qatar. Why in the world would I ever go to Qatar? Other than the fact that a bunch of old guys from around the world got paid off to vote for it, you know? Like we're going to be there. We didn't decide this. We're showing up. We're going to have a good time. We're gonna make, we're gonna watch some soccer. We're gonna experience the local cultures, and we're gonna talk about it on this podcast. Yep. So I am looking forward to that. One month um, away. It's kind of wild. It honestly, it really is. Like, um, 
I still have to do like because I'm Qatar is just like the midpoint of my trip. Like I'm gonna stop in England on the way there, I'm gonna stop in Spain on the way back. Obviously, I'm gonna be asking you for more notes on places and things to do. I in got you. These countries. It's it's always good to know people that have done such things. We try to be the guides for all y'all while I need guides for myself to do that. <laughs> um but yeah, like I'm getting on a plane, I'll be going to London. I gotta figure out where I'm staying in London. I'm going to Madrid. Got to figure out where I'm going to be in Madrid. But it's the World Cup every four years. You know, it, it, with the U.S. missing the last one, it almost feels like it's been since Brazil since there's been a World Cup. Like mm-hmm. it just, and this one being so different than all of the others, it's it is wild. It's creeping up on you. We're gonna yeah. be talking rosters soon enough. You know, a couple of weeks, a couple of weeks, insane. It's all going down. Yeah. Well, we'll kind of close out now, you know, we'll uh, grab our tab and we'll call it for the night. Um, Thanks for tuning in. We're going to have some more content between now and the beginning of the tournament in Qatar. Uh, The extent of that content is based on our availability. Um, Obviously life gets in the way, but Donald was busy gallivanting around Europe. So we had a way to do this. But Donald, anything you want to plug? No, I mean, continue to follow here at Pocket Cafe. I know you'll post that at Stars Stripes FC on, on Twitter, also stars and stripes fc.com. We're gonna have a ton, a ton of content coming up for the World Cup and during the World Cup. So uh like for the daily, you know, articles on uh, where to discuss games, you know, other stuff involved in the US men's national team, and also the women have a couple of friendlies coming up against Germany next month. Uh Stay tuned to all of that. It's going to be, a, I mean, I'm going to be writing basically when Eric and I are not attending matches in, in Doha, uh, which will be in the middle of the night for you so that everyone can wake up and have stuff to read. So uh, definitely, definitely follow that. It does remind me we have to, we have to figure out where we're watching Bill's Lions um, in Doha. I think there's a sports bar that I'm clued in on that will have football. Mm-hmm. Um and that'll be like the you know one football game of the day, so they don't have to like we don't have to worry about like some someone coming in and saying, "Oh my god, like the Steelers aren't playing." Like, yeah. out of here! It's one I game mean, on that day. If the timing works out, it's gonna be prime time in Doha. It's on. It's the only game going on right then. And I mean, it's Bills Lions. You know, throw out the record books. And if U.S. Soccer, if their party has TVs. Mm. Then it's on. Oh, it will be on for sure. Uh, thank you again to all of you who subscribe to our Patreon. Really appreciate it. Um, if you have any co- ideas for future one more rounds you want us to do, uh, I know you guys have given us some great suggestions in the past. We've still got a list, a running list of these ideas. We're going to knock them all out as we go. Um, but yeah, love the feedback. If someone shared this with you and you're listening in and you're like, Oh, this is fun. Subscribe to our Patreon, patreon.com slash podcast. Really appreciate you tuning in and uh, yeah, go bills. (laughs) I hate you. (laughs) 